Okay, I think for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and um, get started here shortly. I'm gonna share my screen and then confirm that, like on every Zoom call, if you can see it. Uh, wait just a moment here. Stacy, I did let me in. Hi, Chris. I'm just about to share my screen. Um, make sure everybody can share. And I'm going to share this lovely image for a second. See the mount, my mountain, my mountain um, island that I would like to escape to. Here we go. So welcome everyone who uh, is joining us today. I made a little funny on our intro slide here. Um, we're gonna be talking about the, uh, the galaxy known as the web. So I don't know if anybody is a, uh, um, a sci-fi reader, but um, this is my, yeah, we got, we got a couple claps, thank you. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Web Editor's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, today, we are going to um, have myself and Chris Rankin speaking about the ins and outs of, of the web. Um, some of you may have, we've already met, but if um, we haven't, just to give a little intro, uh, I started about a year ago and I am the uh, Director of Web and Digital Strategy. So the improvements that you've seen over on the, the homepage, um, some changes that we've made to our designs and templates, um, those are some of the projects that I've been spearheading. And I really wanna talk, come today to talk about some, some best practices. Uh, Chris is going to go over some accessibility and some AEM, AEM training at the end. I wanna make sure that this is very casual. And um, so at any point you have a question, please just let me know. Um, I will have a Q&A after I go over best practices and then we'll do a Q&A at the end as well. So at any point, if you have a question about what I'm talking about, would like me to elaborate, just please jump in. So in terms of best practices today, we're gonna talk five areas in which um, you can improve your, your web game. And for those of you who uh, read the newsletter, you may have actually seen an article that I published in the newsletter for web editors, um, those five tips. But we're gonna really dive into each of those five tips today and um, discuss more of the theoretical ideology behind web. And then we'll get more into the technical with Chris. So let's talk about planning your page. Um, as, as many projects, you want to have, you want to come to the table with a, a real clear plan on what that is. Some of you may be familiar with this PDCA, um, continuous improvement cycle. <clears throat> I am a firm believer, um, in that practice for the web, because, um, as you may have already figured out on your web pages, it's never done. It's, it's a continuous, it's a continuous improvement. Um, there's always edits. Um, it's not one of those things you, you polish, put up on a, on a, um, on a shelf and call it done. It's, it's always changing. So with that, I, I really do recommend that you follow through the PDCA kind of plan. So let's talk first about what I, 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 how I start when I plan the page. I really want to identify what the objective is of the page. And if it's just to have a page with, um, you know, I have to have a page. Well, do you really have to have a page? <laughs> um, what is the page supposed to accomplish? Let's really dive into that. 
who is the, the most important audience? I know most of our pages here at NKU have a multiple audience kind of um, feel. You've got you know, students, you've got faculty, staff, you know, um, external audiences to think about, but we really need to think well, who's the most important audience member and kind of tailor your, your, your pages around that. Um, any additional audiences beyond that one focus um, will find what they need to out of it, but you, you, you certainly don't want to try to make it a um, jack of all trades because then it becomes a master of none. So it's important to understand the audience and what they were trying to accomplish and what you want them to do. So um, with that, Let's, let's close this down. <laughs> we do not need any, there we go, distractions, sorry. Um, so what is, that, what is that objective? And who, who's that audience member and what do you want them to do? And then take that information and develop a game plan based on how you're going to get them to do that action. Um, to do so, you're going to really need to identify, okay, what's your deadline? What has previous analytics been like for that particular audience member? Um, what resources do I need to provide them? Um, are there any roadblocks or um, is there content maybe that needs to be established? Um, and, and to gather that all in one place. And then decide really what that content's gonna look like. And what I typically do is I make a very rough outline. Um, I don't try to fill in the blanks. I'm just trying to um, itemize a list of what needs to go on that page. And I've identified the strengths for that particular content where you might need to get someone to help you develop. And make sure all of that really aligns to what your objective is and what you want the person to do, the user who is viewing your page. And I typically like to use Teams um, if you're creating new development to kind of collaborate and to gather all of your content in one section. Um, I don't know if, if if you've used Teams like that before, but it's very easy to set up a Teams account and um, add people that would collaborate on your content. Um, even working on documents live within Teams to be able to sculpt your, your messaging. Any questions about planning your page? Um, yeah, Stacey, I had one question. You mentioned analytics. Is that something that we can look at as web editors? Yes, yes. In fact, um, we use Google Analytics and it's very simple to provide you access to the Google Analytics account. I would just need a Gmail account. Um, for some reason, the NKU email address doesn't work <laughs> correctly. Um, in the Google Analytics account, but I can provide you access to that data. Um, if you are not familiar with Google Analytics and you need a little help, I can certainly um, you know, provide some assistance there. Um, but it's pretty simple for you to be able to identify everything in your particular um, college or department and really refine what that looks like and then compare that to data that, that maybe is from a year ago um, or two years ago. One thing I do wanna kind of put in, in when it comes to analytics right now is that we may not be comparing apples to apples um, <laughs> because this last year has been kind of, um, it's been a little, a little crazy. I don't know if anybody noticed, <laughs> but we've had a lot of, um, a lot of, um, uh, chaos and, and some of that is reflected, I found, in the, um, in the data use of the site. Um, but again, I'm more than happy to help, help there. 
Did that, did I answer your question there? Yes, I think so. Sorry, some came No worries. But yeah, um, do you want me to just like send you an email if I want to get access to the Google Analytics? Yep, it just send me your, a Gmail account and I'll, I'll add you. Thank you. So next we want to talk about, you know, your content. And um, I'm going to say this over and over and over again. Um, I, I'm sure you, if you took a little ticker and see how many times I say audience <laughs> and objective, I'm sure you're going to find it's going to be a lot today um, because it is very important to speak to the, the particular audience. Um, you're going to find that successful pages are going to align their messaging and their type of, of, of messaging to that content. Um, to that audience. So keeping in mind what they want to, what you want them to accomplish, what you want to accomplish, what you want them to do, you're going to take that content and you're going to make sure it's as concise as possible. Um, I, I will tell you, I have, I have a, um, two college age students, um, my children, who um, will look at a page or look at information and if it's got a lot of text on it, they are like, no, I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm only gonna scan it. I'll look for the pretty picture and maybe a button and go from there. So less is more. Um, again, speaking the language of the audience is important. I know that we're, a lot of us are in the academia industry but we need to make sure that we're speaking to our, our audience. So if your audience is a student, it needs to be very simple and short and um, not a lot of flowery academic language. Um, and the same thing would apply even if you are working uh, with a community engagement type of, of audience where you're, you're working with, um, different companies, um, they may not be familiar with a lot of the jargon associated with higher, higher ed. So speak to the, to the audience. Uh, breaking it up into bite-sized chunks and sections and um, keeping that sectional kind of idea, um, kind of making it fresh so that when you get to the page, it's not very overwhelming. And if you section that content and add some visuals, you're going to find that you're really, you're really going to have more traffic lower on the page. Um, we are in the age of scrolling. You know, kids, they're on their device. They're used to scrolling. Um, there for a while, we had a pretty a pretty big trend to have websites that were just one huge long page. I'm not suggesting that by any means, <laughs> but don't be afraid of, um, of scrolling a little bit. It used to be that it was like above the fold. You, you only saw what was above the fold, but it's just really not true anymore. And tell a story, take your content and form it around either um, interesting stories that are from your, uh, your, your audience's perspective. So if it's students, try to, to get testimonials to build credibility. Um, highlight maybe what they're doing, a day in the life, or um, something that identifies the content to the user. So the user can look at it and say, oh, wow, that could be me. Um, same thing. Same thing applies to you know, community engagement pieces. Um, if we could get alumni um, support with testimonials, it does help build credibility. Um, within the story, make sure you're addressing key concerns if there are any. And of course, highlighting the benefits to the user. Um, sometimes it's really hard to um, step back from your content and not think about it like, oh, well, this is important and this is important because we think all of it's important, right? But to, to come from that audience of the user of, okay, what's really important to the user and then highlighting those benefits. Don't forget to add action items. So I'm gonna call um, 
say this throughout, call to actions, CTAs, they're very important. Use, you've already identified what you want them to do. Use that call to action several times in your content at the top, use it again at the bottom, keep, keep using it. And then finally, check your work. Um, I can't even tell you how many times I've come across, you know, typos or that type of thing. And it's, I know it's really hard when you're putting it together because you see it so long that you don't see it anymore. <laughs> so um, use, use tools like Grammarly to find your errors. Um, make sure you're checking through the accessibility um, checklist. There, that's on the accessibility site. And that link will be provided to you again. Um, but accessibility is very important. So once you get your content the way you want, the page the way you want, just go back through and do a little check. Okay, that image, it has all of its alt, alt text, descriptive alt text. Um, all of my links are dynamic, meaning they don't have the HTTP in front of them if they're on the site, if they're an internal link. It should say something like slash content slash www or inside. For all internal links, all links that are on the site, it should be dynamic. And that's really important because if something happens to that page, if that page changes location, it's gonna automatically update. Otherwise you're gonna end up with broken links and we don't want to send someone down a rabbit hole, right? <laughs> um, because that, that, that creates a, a perception. And again, I'm gonna say the word again, accessibility. Check your links for accessibility as well. Um, it shouldn't be, it should be a descriptive link. Um, and I know that Chris will go into more of this later. Um, so I won't harp on it. No, I'm gonna harp on it. Accessibility is very important. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's those are my rules for developing content. Does anybody have a question about any of those? Okay, moving on here. Um, oh, I got a little tip there that I forgot about. So once you get your, your web page kind of together, um, and it's kind of a part of that check your work category, but if you can, if you have a student worker or you have an ambassador or you have um, a connection um, with one of your third party external folks, have someone review it and without a whole lot of guidance so that they, can be your test subject to see how what they took away from your content. This is really good because as I said, you get near the weeds and it's hard to see the forest from the trees when you're in it and you're making it. So have someone test it. Did they follow your, your call to action? Did they do the action that you wanted them to? Did they take away from the page content um, with the feelings that you wanted to, to um, Enlicit. So you've heard the, the glitchy um, saying, form follows function, and it does, it does. I know we wanna make sure the web pages look nice, but um, the foundation for them to look nice really is that they function. Um, you could put up a, a pretty painting on there and I'm, I'm gonna love it because I love art, um, but if your, your um, objective is to get me to fill out a form and to do X, Y, Z, I'm probably not gonna do that just because I'm there looking at the painting. <laughs> um, it's, gotta, it's gotta function. The number one functionality of that is access. Uh, I told you I was gonna say it a lot. Accessibility is important. Um, you, you, you certainly wouldn't, would not want to exclude anyone from your content just because they can't understand it from their, their screen reader or whatever other reason. Um, so accessibility is very important. Image alt text, nested headings. I know that Chris will go over that. Um, secondly is navigation. Uh, 
background, navigation is very important because as a, our site's very large, I know that you all are managing your area. Um, you may have 20, 15 to 20 pages, but our total site is about 15,000 pages. <laughs> it's huge. And for someone who's coming in, who maybe has only been to our site maybe once before or never before, um, navigating through to find what they want can sometimes be very challenging. So it, it's important to consider that your navigation needs to be consistent. Um, you wanna nest your details. You don't wanna put all of your details on your homepage. You kinda wanna take them through, but you wanna be careful not to go too far into the weeds and have, you know, have it nested six layers down. So navigation is pretty important. It's one of those things that I put together before I even put together a content on a page. I, I understand, okay, well, I need to take them down this path because this is my objective and this is my audience. And if there's a lot of data, sometimes you gotta be really creative about how you put that navigation together. Um, for instance, the housing site. When I was working with David on the housing site, we had some really clear audience divisions and some of that content overlapped, but you have to keep in mind, new students aren't going to understand some of the words that we're putting out there to current students. So we had we, we decided to take that navigation and make it streamlined for the audience and figure out ways to put content in one area that would update in other areas for that. It was quite complicated, but to meet the needs of the audience and to get them to do what they need to do, we felt that that navigation was a better choice. So you, you need to really think about that when you're starting to put together in your first step, when you start to plan. So consistent navigation. Um, Uploading images to the digital asset management system is an important way to manage your image, your image assets. And yes, you can technically, it lets you in the system in AEM to add it on the page, but I'm gonna tell you, and I'm sure Chris is gonna say something about this as well. There, the reason why it needs to go in the digital asset management system is because it compresses it for one, when it uploads. If the file's too large, and when I say too large, meaning it's over a meg, um, it really should be kind of small, like 200, 500 KB. <laughs> um, if it's really large, I won't let you upload it. Um, but if it is a little bit larger, let's say it's a JPEG that that you got from somebody and it's, it's relatively, it, it's not huge, um, it's going to compress that for you when that it gets uploaded. Other people would be able to use it if it's there. And it's not uploading every single time that the page uploads. So if, if the image is on the page itself, it will bog down the pages. It could affect um, search results like on Google. There's a lot of reasons why it's really important to to upload your images to the digital asset management system before you add them to the page. And it will just make your, your site, your, your pages function better. Dynamic linking. I've already mentioned this. It's also a, a big sticking point in AEM. Um, when you link to something, whether it's a link that is to an asset on the digital asset management system, like the PDF, or it's to a page in another part of the site, you need to use the, the content viewer and click on the little magnifying glass and open and go through the, the, the hierarchy of the site and select it. Don't go out and get the URL and copy and paste it into the thing because it's not going to update that link if something happens to that asset. Mobile views. Now you see this little picture here. They've got kind of highlighted what, it, what they want it to look like for their desktop. Um, keep in mind that like 70% of our audience in, in terms of students 
are looking at things either on their, their tablet or their phone. So you wanna make sure that it's mobile friendly. And there are some things that we can do, um, some more advanced features on your site that you could have some things to show on desktop, but maybe not on mobile. If for some reason it's not very mobile friendly, we can work with you, just reach out. I'm gonna say that a lot too. Please reach out, I'm happy to help where I can. And then of course, test, test, test. So when it comes to form, I will say that, you know, we've got some pretty good styles already baked into our templates. Um, and for the most part, I think everyone does a really good job at trying to add interest and consistent consistency on their sites. Um, but the big thing would be just to kind of prioritize your content. It, it, it goes back to that content ide ideology. Um, what do you want them to do? and to prioritize that from top to bottom um, and adding in those action, action buttons. You can um, increase margins. I do say that that's something that I've seen throughout the site um, where we've got a lot of content kind of smooshed together. So if you would utilize um, spacer um, components with the NKU text component, kind of put one of one or two of those in between sections. Um, that, that adds a lot of um, relaxation to a page. It makes it easier for people to, to kind of visually scan the page for what they're looking for. Um, white space is very important. Um, again, we're not gonna fret over scrolling. So that little bit of margin is good. <laughs> and then we also have a container tag. Um, I've spoke, spoken with a few of you here about container tags. Um, it's listed as a style under the column control component as an option. And basically what a container tag does is it builds in some, some margins on the left and right. Um, the way that the site was created, it was created with it to, re to, to resize based on the device. Well, a lot of people now have these very large monitors. I know I have a couple of them. Um, and but the way, if you have content that goes from edge to edge, you're actually kind of going like this, scanning, scanning the page. So the container tag, just helps keep it to where it's visually more appealing when they get to those larger devices. Um, I typically will use that container tag inside other tags. So let's say you want a, um, a, um, a column that's got that light silver background. I'll put the light silver and then I'll put another one inside the silver one with the container. So it's got a nice tidy little margin. Um, I might put two, um, two of those text components at the top, two of them at the bottom of that section, and then build my content in there. And that gives it, like I said, some breathing room. Um, it, makes a, it, it makes a big difference. It really does. And when you're putting together your columns, for those different sections that we talked about, uh, consider putting in a variety of, of layouts. You know, if you've got content that maybe will fit with a three column, and then you've got maybe a two column, maybe it's a half and half or um, two thirds third layout, um, just kind of break it up because that will make it a lot more visually interesting and it will create movement. Um, of the user's eye to, to areas that you want them to go to. Integrating graphics and photos, um, it's a great way to add some personality to, to your pages. Um, if you do not have photography and or graphics that, that adequately um, support your content, maybe consider putting in a request at Marcom for um, photography to be taken. 
or look on some that we have a lot there's lots of um photography free royalty free photography out there um pixabay is a good one and i can send out that and resources after after our meeting today but i i've used pixabay don't go on Google and find something. We, we don't want to open ourselves up with copyright issues, but there are lots of options available to you to, to break up your, your, the content. Again, less is more. <laughs> and um, consider reserving yellow instead of using the yellow backgrounds. Um, consider saving that for your buttons, because again, the whole point and the objective is to get them to do something. Um, and if we have a lot of yellow on the page, it can be kind of overwhelming of what, what do I look at? Where do I go? What's, why is this so important? Why is this being highlighted? You know, students are using highlighters to highlight things. That's basically what we're doing. We're highlighting something. And if it's a huge content area, that, that can be kind of overwhelming. So try to use that just for, for your buttons um and maybe use more of the the silver and the gray and the black backgrounds to break up those sections don't be afraid of white white space is good and then of course i'm going to tell you again to test drive your page with um the, some kind of audience member um for both form and function um it this could really help identify areas that that you want to adjust to make sure they're working well and look at, at your mobile device check it out on if you have you know your phone or a tablet or something that you could see how your page reacts to those things um, there might be something you didn't re didn't see didn't realize until you tested it on your mobile device thoughts Questions about that? So there's one of those keywords that I've used a lot. Navigation, it's very important. Um, keep it simple, keep it consistent. The homepage, um, the horizontal navigation is definitely welcome on, on the, the homepage of that particular um, section or department or college or whatever um the horizontal navigation you're going to want to try to limit that to five to seven things because once it starts getting more than that one you're not gonna you're, you're giving too many options to to kind of direct your audience but two it could go on to that next line and it really looks weird when you've got so many things on that horizontal menu and you've got two lines of them it's like, are all of those, e you know, are all of those equally important? Probably not. Um, consider nesting them so that you can keep to that five to seven. Personally, I think five is perfect number, but I've seen seven fit on one line. Um, all of your sub pages should have left navigation. There really isn't any um any exception to that rule i i don't i don't know of any exception to that rule um <laughs> unless that there's there's you, you want to keep them there and you don't want them to navigate anywhere after that <laughs> um and then of course limiting the nesting as i mentioned earlier um i know in some cases there's a lot of content but try not to have things go more than two levels deep. So that would be your homepage and then a menu item and then one more menu item under that. I wouldn't go any deeper than that um, in terms of best practices. And I know I had mentioned this earlier about um, reorganizing your navigation. Maybe it makes more sense for it to be by audience than, than content type. Um, if that's the case, if you find that you're going down that direction, um, I'm happy to consult and provide you some ideas of how you might want to make it easy to, to maintain that content. Because you don't want to have to maintain the same content multiple times 
in different locations. There's, there's ways around that in AEM. Any questions on navigation? Okay. Accessibility, yes, I haven't said it enough. I'm gonna say it again on its own slide and then we're gonna talk about it again after that. Um, <laughs> accessibility, um, super top priority um, initiative for NKU. Um, I know that many of you have gone through accessibility training um, as web developers. Um, and there's lots of resources out there. It can seem kind of overwhelming, but there's, it's really not. It's not that overwhelming in terms of once you know your checklist and once you get into a, um, a habit of doing particular things before you launch a, launch a page, it's really not difficult. Um, but we're happy to help where, where you need it. So if you have a question or you need some help in terms of accessibility, we're here. In fact, if you go to the accessibility site, you're gonna see that there's a button there where you can actually request help um, specifically for accessibility. But the main things are obviously nesting, um, tagging the headers appropriately. Um, let's use comp some you know, common sense in terms of the, the um, how you how you phrase your links and some detailed information on your your alt text for your images. Um, have have your alt text read as if someone is explaining what that picture looks like. It it shouldn't just be student. <laughs> it should be very descriptive. Um, you know set of three female students in student union discussing, I don't know, physics around a laptop. It should be pretty, it should be pretty specific. I mean, um, I know if I had to rely on someone explaining to me what things look like, I would, I would want details. And then of course, um, when it comes to videos, if you are utilizing videos on your pages, they need to have um, captions on them. If you're using YouTube to facilitate hosting that video, that can be, that is built into YouTube. You just need to edit it. And um, in some cases, I also post the transcript. So um, I know that Chris is gonna go over this a little bit more, but when I do send this PowerPoint out, there is the link here um, that has um, where you can ask for more help. And um, I'm sure Chris will dive into these a little bit more. So what's next? Um, so the, my suggested actions would be to um, evaluate your site based on the five things that I told you about your, well, creating a plan, because remember it's, it's a continuous cycle. Um, evaluating your content, your navigation, how you want um, your user, what actions you want your user to take, and then, ex then experiment a little bit with different layouts. Um, maybe it's on the homepage that you really focus on some different, different ways of communicating your information. And then three months from now, take a look at it. Did that improve people clicking through to a particular area of your site? Um, look at your, what your competitor, what our competitors are doing for some ideas. I mean, we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, as I mentioned before, requesting some assistance when it comes to photography or graphics. Um, and of course, reaching out if you have questions or you want some help, maybe you want me to be that impartial review. Um, I'm happy to do that. And then some additional resources. Um, again, I'll send this out um, for you afterwards so you can click on those links, but we do have a web editing guide. Um, there's some wonderful articles on, well, there's some articles on there. There's um, how-to instructions, 
for navigating through AEM, maybe you need a little refresher on something. Um, and then of course there's contacts if anyone needed to schedule training, et cetera. And then the accessibility site who has a particular section just for web. Um, there are other accessibility um, topics on there as well, but you can use uh, on there, there's a tool that you can do contrast checker to make sure that you're providing enough contrast color. Um, and there are some how-to instructions there as well. I'm sure that Chris will, will uh, mention that as well. And that's pretty much it. If in terms of questions, if you have any questions, speak up now um, for the best practices. I'm gonna hand this off to Chris here in a minute. We'll take questions again at the end. But at any time, anyone has any questions or best practice discussion or review, reach out to me. I am available on Teams. Questions? Okay, well, um, I'm gonna then hand the mic over to Chris and I'm gonna stop sharing though so that you can take over. Here we go. Thanks. Groovy. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Chris. Um, I'm gonna go over uh, some stuff regarding accessibility uh, as well as uh, the basics of AEM uh, website construction and editing. Um, I do offer uh, these uh, two trainings uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so if you'd like to have a more in-depth uh, kind of deep dive into this stuff, uh, definitely sign up for that or get in touch with me. Uh, I'm available on Teams as well, or you can contact me by email uh, and we can set up a, uh, a personalized uh, training uh, at a time of your choice uh, should those uh, things, uh, those timings not be convenient for you. Um, but with that out of the way, uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. It's my turn. Uh, let's see here. And share. It's been so long since I've done a Zoom call. Um, okay, so um, we have a bit of a checklist. Um, everyone see my mouse over here and my PowerPoint? We're good? Okay. Uh, I have a bit of a checklist in regard to accessibility. I'm going to go over those uh, pretty high level uh, just so that we have an idea of what we're looking for in regard to accessibility. Uh, Stacy covered a lot of these already, so I'm not going to uh, heavily belabor the point. Um, but uh, just to get things started, um, the whole goal of all of this is to make sure our content is easy to read, uh, easy to access uh, for all of our users. Um, and you know, the big sexy ones are, you know, the hearing impaired, visually impaired, um, but also for those people you don't really consider, like people with reading disabilities, such as uh, dyslexia. We want to make sure that those people can access the content easily as well. Um, we want to make sure that we are using our uh, headings effectively. Um, screen readers utilize headings to allow uh, folks to who are visually impaired to skim your page. Um, if you have a lot of content on your on your page, uh, especially text-based content, um, those headings are really really key to make sure someone who is blind or visually impaired can access that content in a timely fashion. You know, without headings, they're just going to have to ha wait for the screen reader to just read their page um, uh, word for word. If you apply head, uh, if you apply headings to it, um, then it allows people to skip to the sections of the content that they actually want to engage with, uh, which is super, super helpful. Um, your hyperlink text needs to make sense completely out of context. Um, we still have uh, web pages out there that have uh, little blurbs of text and then directly beneath them, there's a line that says, click here for more info. Um, and that is 
completely useless for somebody who is blind uh, because a person who is visually impaired, again, screener, going to go out and get those links. Um, and it's going to present them with link, fly by whatever the link text is. So if you have link that says click here, they're just going to get click here and have no idea where that goes. So it's super important that whatever the text of your link is, that is descriptive of wherever it is going to be taking that person so they can make an educated uh, decision about whether or not to click that link. Um, our alternate text, you know, just like Stacy said, it needs to be descriptive of the image that you're using. Uh, you need to ask yourself, if I couldn't see this, how would I want it, someone to describe it to me, right? Any given image can be described in any number of ways. Um, so it is important for you to decide what about that image is important and how you want to describe it. Um, it's not only going to tell somebody what it is, but it's also going to give them a point of view. Um, you're going to decide for them what about this image is important and how that is described. Um, but knowing that it's also important to not go the other way. Uh, we don't want people to encounter a surprise novel anytime that they encounter one of your images. So descriptive, but concise. Uh, keep it to about a sentence, maybe maybe two, if, if it's really something that you want to hammer home what you're describing. Um, digital media, uh, Stacey talked about this. We have to have an accurate uh, caption on videos or uh, a, a, an accurate transcript of whatever it happens to be. Um, and automatically generated captions provided by YouTube are not in and of themselves um, accessible. Uh, YouTube is getting better at it. Um, other uh, uh, services like Vimeo and Kaltura um, are also doing their best, but uh, in more uh, often than not, uh, if you are not speaking very slowly in a standard Midwestern accent, uh, doesn't really know what you're saying. Uh, so if you're utilizing those uh, automatically generated captions, do make sure you go in after the fact, edit them to make sure that they are both accurate and that they are timed in a way that makes it easy to read. Uh, we want to avoid uh, what I call caption karaoke, which is you know what often happens with automatically generated captions where the words just pop up on the screen as they're being spoken. Um, not an ideal situation because then the user just has to be glued to the screen that's just reading uh, whatever is being said as is being said. Um, we want them to be able to read ahead and then be able to focus on what the person is doing uh, and their facial expressions so they're getting the full picture. Um, okay, so the next thing, uh, follow the rules. Uh, <laughs> uh, we wanna make sure that uh, all of Marcom's design standards are being followed. Uh, so. We want to make sure that we are doing things like, you know, minimizing the amount of yellow that we're using. I have a question, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, um, when you're talking about the links, um, like don't right click here, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how that applies with emails. Um, so like if I'm sending emails, I know sometimes email systems will um, remove like hyperlinks and things like that. So is it better if I'm sending an email to a prospective student, like replying to their question to put, a hyperlink in there that says like such and such program and hyperlinked or is it better to put in like the https nku.edu that it's the whole link which can kind of make it clunky but it's what i usually do because i'm afraid it's going to remove the links if, when i get sent to them i honestly am not uh, an expert on that specific instance um stacy do you have uh, any idea on that one yeah i so i would recommend doing like you do on, on the web page. So it would be learn more about the college education's blah, blah, blah program. Like that would be the whole link <laughs> that takes you to place. Um, if they have plain text on their email set, it will just reduce all of that to, it would include the HTTP blah, blah, blah. It will include all of that. So it'll look better. Um, if you actually do the link like you would on the website. Okay. Thanks. Just don't do the click here part. 
right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Stacy. Um, right. So follow the Marcom standards. Uh, that's super, super important. Uh, and be uh, diligent about when you're going in and you're trying to do like an overhaul of your content. Maybe it's that once a semester or once a year uh, time where you go in and say, okay, we're going to get the dust off. Check in with Marcom and see if there's anything new that's going on uh, that we need to be uh, aware of uh, and make sure that, you know, your web page fits in with all the other web pages that are being done right now from scratch, right? Um, tables and headers. Uh, so not everyone's using tables on their web pages, and that's fine. Um, oh, we don't want tables at all. Is that what, is that what I'm saying? It would be, perf it would, I would prefer not to have tables. And it has not to do with accessibility really so much as it has to do with mobile viewing because tables do not re render well on, um, on your phone. They, they, don't, they don't really work well on these little phones. So um, if you can not put it in a table and put it another way, that would be plus. But if you have to do a table, make sure it's accessible. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there it is. Uh, if you can't avoid a table, try to display your content in a different way. If you do have to have one, uh, then you need to make sure that your table has a header on it. Uh, that you have a header row, header row full of header cells. Uh, AEM defines table cells in two ways. It is either data or header. And if you have a table with no header cells, it's just going to read each cell in turn, uh, which is going to be a nightmare uh, for uh, someone who is visually impaired to parse. Um, so do make sure that you have uh, headers on all of your tables. Uh, avoid them if you at all can. Um, color. Color is a big one. We want to make sure that we have high contrast between our foreground and background elements. So no yellow text on a white background or vice versa. Um, we also want to make sure that uh, we're not fully reliant on color to convey a message. Um, people uh, are wonderful. We have uh, this beautiful thing in our brain that has this built-in pattern of rec recognition. Uh, so we all culturally know things like green is good, red is bad, but not everyone can see red and green. Um, not everyone can see color in general. And in, gen and in addition to that uh, whole argument, we also have to consider that if someone's printing things out, our students are not all rich, right? Uh, so when presented with the uh, choice of printing something in color uh, for 50 cents a page or printing it in black and white for eight cents a page, they're probably gonna go with the cheaper option. In both cases, you need to make sure that whatever you're presenting to the person tracks, right? You wanna make sure that your message is not being lost with the color. So make sure you're, if you're using visual shorthand, that you're presenting it in multiple avenues. If you're using color, make sure you're also using shapes or make sure you're also using text um, to supplement that visual shorthand. Uh, and that will ensure that even if someone's printing your very pretty chart in black and white, that they can still parse the information. Um, and then lastly, documents uh, and file names need to be descriptive of whatever their contents are. Um, we want to avoid automatically generated file names like IMG2352. Uh, no one knows what that is, and no one can know what that is uh, until they open it up and see. Um, the other side effect of that is that no one can search for that. Uh, so always, 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 always make sure that your file names and your document titles describe in some way whatever the contents of that file is. Um, this is going to do two things for you. One, it's going to make sure that your users uh, can uh, have some sort of idea of what it is they're downloading. Um, and two, it's going to allow your colleagues <laughs> to search for things instead of having to dig through the various K drive folders 
uh, and file share uh, reserves that you happen to have looking for that one thing that they could have searched for inside of five minutes, right? Um, any questions regarding accessibility before I move on to the tech part of our presentation? Groovy. All right, so I'm gonna stress it one more time. Uh, I just breeze through all this. This is a lot of stuff. Uh, I do these accessibility trainings every week, uh, multiple times a week, usually. Um, and I am available by email and Teams if you wanna set up a, uh, a personalized session uh, to go over all of these things in depth. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and now proceed to the technical part of our situation. Um, so here I have basically a, a demo web page uh, in AEM. This is in the actual editor, as you can see. Um, and uh, we have a, a whole bunch of things going on here. And I just wanna point out a few of them. Uh, firstly, we have our text. Uh, you can see right here, I have a header. It has a gray background. Uh, if you are going to use a background, uh, try to lean toward the grays and blacks. Um, it is going to do a couple things. One, if we have our students who are viewing uh, things on phones uh, at, in the middle of their very dark dorm at the dead of night, it's not going to flash their eyes and you know make them blind for a few minutes. Um, as a user, personally, I always, always, always lean for the dark themed uh, web page and applications um, because I too am a nocturnal creature and I don't like to have uh, that moment of, oh God, I can't see anymore when I pull up a web page. Um, but uh, white on uh, black text on white is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. If you do want to add some color interest to it, lean toward something that is less um, visually abrasive as the gold. Uh, save that for things that you really want to point out. Um, for headings, uh, I have listed here uh, a heading two as well as a heading three. These are the two headings that you're going to be using the most often. Uh, we don't want to go too deep into the weeds and subheadings. So uh, if you need to, obviously go to heading four and five as needed, but uh, these are the two that you're going to be wanting to utilize the most. You can see the difference there. Uh, there's a slight uh, size difference as far as the font is concerned, but we also have the visual key that this is in all caps and this is not. Um, also note that even though this is displaying in all caps, you do not want to be typing in all caps. Uh, this is a style a piece of code in the background that is making this display in this way. If a screen reader sees that you have typed in all caps, it will read out or will spell out your word instead of reading it. Um, so avoid that when possible. Uh, if I go in and edit this, uh, you can see uh, that it all looks basically the same. Um, we do have our links here. I have an external link, I have an internal link. Uh, for our external link, I can go in here, see what it looks like. I've just typed in the URL. That's the only way to do it. Um, and it is totally fine to do it in this way. However, uh, like Stacy said, for our internal links for NKU web pages, for NKU documents that are on the file system, you want to be using a dynamic link. And that looks like this. This is not a URL, this is a file path. The reason why we do it in this way is because when a system, when the system sees that uh, you have changed this web page, you have moved it to a different location, you have renamed it in some way, it is going to update all the links to this page to make sure that they do not break. If you type in the URL, you can someone will move that page, someone will rename that page eventually, and then all of your links to that page are just going to no longer function. So we want to avoid that. You can attain this by simply clicking on the little magnifying glass right here, go through the file system and find whatever the page happens to be. Now, if you don't know where it is, I don't blame you. This is a maze. 
Uh, so you may want to have a map. If I want to get to this Clery Act page, I like to use uh, NKU Police as a good example. Uh, I can do this. I can go to the page. So I'll go to inside, or rather, I just go to nku.edu slash police. Click on their Clery Act page. And behold, your map. Uh, the URL for your web page is going to be a map to where it is in the file system. Every time you see a slash, you're going to have a folder. So in this case, I have Inside NKU, Student Affairs, Departments, Police, Clery Act. So if I go, go here, I have Inside NKU, and then I scroll down here, find Student Affairs, there we are, and then Departments, and then I look for Police. I know that because the alphabet works in a certain way that there is no police folder but since I've done this a whole bunch of times, I know that there is a university police folder. This is a common thing. Uh, your, your URL may not be a one-to-one -one relationship with the names of the folders. The most common deviation is that instead of a department name, you will have a folder that's named inside, followed by the department name. Be aware of that and be aware that there will always be a folder there. Uh, it just may not be named precisely the same. Do we have any questions regarding that? Cool. Uh, moving on from there, uh, Stacy mentioned buttons a minute ago. Uh, buttons are great. Buttons add a nice dynamic uh, element to your web page. They're very, very pretty. Uh, you can add them by selecting a piece of text, uh, usually a link, uh, and then going to the style dropdown over here in the upper left-hand corner. This will give you a whole bunch of options. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to ignore the bottom four uh, in most cases. These are modal buttons. Uh, you'll say, see that they are listed as slideshow or people directory or read more style link. Um, these are gonna give little pop-out windows for displaying text, um, which is a nice little element. Uh, I'm not really sure on the accessibility uh, part of that, but uh, we'll leave that to Bridget uh, Evans for right now. In any case, um, the top three options are what you're going to be using the most option, most often. They come in three colors. You notice that the third one says for black background. That is because that will render the text pure white. Uh, I'll show you that here in just a moment. Um, but for the other uh, needs, the yellow and dark gray button will work just fine. Uh, I'll show you both. So here's yellow. Uh, here is yellow outline, click OK, and behold, here's the yellow button, and here's the yellow outline button. Can't see that. Even when you hover over that, it turns yellow, and you can't see that on a white background. So we want to avoid that when we're, when we're not utilizing a dark background color. If you want to utilize background colors, you can find them underneath the Advanced tab on just about any uh, component. Uh, most of them will have this advanced tab and that will house the class dropdown. Text is gonna have pretty much the most uh, classes available to you. Uh, uh, we have our columns, which will separate your text into two or three columns. And we have our background colors that come in four flavors. Um, underneath here, you'll also find the classes for the header text if you want to utilize that. Classes, you want to be careful of because classes apply to the entire component. Uh, you can have one component, well, one class per component, that class applies to the entirety of the component. So if you utilize the header classes, that header text font is going to be applied to all the text within that component, which is why you want to have a separate uh, component like we have right here. Make sense? I'm gonna go ahead and select a background color just to have some fun. There we go. When you apply a background color, it is going to change some things. You'll notice that uh, my text color has changed from black to white. That's good, maintain side contrast. Uh, but you'll also notice that some things have not changed. Uh, my buttons have not done anything. 
you always want to make sure that whatever background color you choose, that your buttons have high contrast with that background color because they are not going to change with it. Um, so if you're using black, yellow, and the yellow outline buttons uh, work great. If you're using a uh, a gray or black, you do not want to use the dark gray button because it's going to kind of blend into the background. Moving on from there, uh, before we move on, do we have any questions regarding text? Cool. Um, images. Uh, images uh, are great, uh, but you need to be careful on how you use them. Um, this is a huge image. I've put it into a tiny column. It's not huge anymore. Uh, if you have any content at all, it's going to be constrained by the column that you put it in, specifically by that width of the column. So if you're using a panoramic image, you need to be careful of how small of a column you put it in because it is going to adjust the size of that image. And it's going to adjust the size of the height to match the width. So panoramic images are going to suffer and they're going to not be legible for very long if you put them into small columns. When you're creating an image or adding an image to your page, you're going to click edit here and it's going to say drop an image or click to upload. Now, Stacy already said this, but I'm going to say it again. For love of all that is good and right in the world, do not click to upload. Bad things happen when you do that. Specifically, that image is not getting optimized. It's not getting compressed. So when your huge HD image is added to the web page, it doesn't matter if you know someone's on a phone and can't really see all those pixels, or if someone's on dial-up and can't download those pixels, they're going to get force-fed them. In the case of the phone user, they're going to be upset with us for using up all their data. In the case of the dial-up user, they're just going to say, nope and they're going to bounce off your web page before it even loads. So even though you can click and look, there's pictures, I can click on this and it looks like it's happy. Don't do that. Instead, you're going to want to add it to the system. In order to do that, you'll need to go out into the web uh, content manager where you'll have an open tab. You're going to click on this little camera button in the gray uh, in the green bar at the top. That will take you to the digital assets manager. From here, you can click on new and browse. And here I can select my same picture and click upload. It's going to upload that to the back of my folder where I see now that I have a new image because it doesn't have a green light. I'm gonna activate my content as I add it because I don't want to forget and then have issues later down the road and then find the thing that's messed up. All right, always uh, activate your content as you add it. I can select it, I can click activate, turns orange, then turns green and I'm good to go. So I can go back here to my page click edit. I can refresh my content manager. And then down here at the bottom, here's my Victor standee, which I can then drag and drop. I need to add my alternate text, which I already have. Click OK. And there we are. Now, again, any content that you add in AEM is going to be constrained by the width of the column that you put it in. So if I take my column control here, which is also constrained by this column width, I can drag it down here to the main content area here. And now those columns and therefore those images are a bit larger. This is going to be consistent with any column that you put it in. You also need to keep in mind that this is a responsive system. So this column width is not gonna be the same from device to device. If I put this on a smaller monitor with a lower resolution, uh, or if my window is somehow smaller, 
behold, the images grow smaller. Keep that in mind when you're designing your web page. You want to make sure that you're not splitting your columns too much because eventually your content is going to become illegible. All right. Now, you notice that I have a panel group here. It's called the Miltons. And the reason why I have the Miltons is because it allows me to make a very uh, poignant uh, demonstration. If I go into my preview mode, you can see that my Miltons are touching. And Miltons should never touch. It's a bad thing. Um, you'll also notice if I scroll down here that my text is right up against these images. There is uh, a bit of an issue with spacing in some of our components, specifically the image components and the panel group components. If you find that you're using one of these and that you need space between your various elements on your web page, there's a way to do that very easily. First, we're going to exit the preview. And we're going to go and find the text component. Uh, grab an in-key text editor, just drag that in between whichever elements you need to have extra space between. Doing that will allow you to create one line of blank white space between those elements. Now, on my preview, I have this little text editor icon, and that's normal. But on your live web page, when it goes out into the wild, it'll be a single line of just blank white space, just to add a little bit of breathing room between your elements. Any questions regarding that? In some instances, just to hop in there, Chris. Yeah. Um, if you've got big sections that you're using to, to really break up content, sometimes I put as many as two um, spacers there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said before, you know, don't be afraid of white space. White space is good. White space breaks up the bricks. Bricks of text are scary. Uh, they cause your users to say, nope, and then they leave. Uh, they don't absorb your content and all that works for nothing. So break up the white space, or sorry, break up the bricks of text. Um, use images, uh, use spacing. Um, and uh, like Stacey said, you wanna reduce the amount of scanning from left to right that the user has to do. Um, that results in what we call eye fatigue. That's when your eyes get tired and you start to lose your place and the, oh wait, did I just read that? Or wait, did I skip a line? We wanna avoid that, right? So reduce the amount of just solid blocks of text, uh, give people a break uh, to just reorient themselves. Uh, and that will make your content much, much more appealing, uh, much, much more accessible. Uh, and you're going to have less people calling you uh, with questions about stuff that could have been answered just by them reading the webpage. Um, that uh, pretty much sums up the, the, the high level stuff that we wanted to cover here uh, today. Uh, there are all obviously much, much more things that we can talk about. Um, but I think at this point, we want to just open it up to questions. Um, if you have questions on accessibility, design, the how-to of uh, AEM, uh, now is the time. Please ask. All right. Um, so I guess, uh, Stacy, unless there's something else you want to cover, we'll wrap things up. Um, obviously, again, we're available. Contact us on Teams, contact us via email. Uh, we want to help. Uh, we're not here to shame you or make fun of you or anything like that. Um, just want to help you out. Yep. And just sometimes be a, um, a, a different set of eyes. You've looked at it for a while and happy to say, oh, how about what if you did this or et cetera, et cetera. I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much everyone for attending today. 
Um, I know that this is being recorded and I'm gonna send out the PowerPoint that I used at the beginning to everyone who was on the call here. Um, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach back out to either Chris or myself. Thank you so much for your time. Great information. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.